three up, two across, tap that play button three times and walk through the archway into Dialogue Alley. Hello and welcome to Dialogue Alley, a podcast all about Harry Potter books, book translations, and all other things magical. I'm Melanie. I'm Carly. And I'm Eric. And the three of us are Harry Potter translation book, book translation, translation book. I don't know. I said it out of order today, (laughs) but we're collectors of these Harry Potter books in all different translations from all over the world. Um, We have rare books. We have books that you can just buy from Barnes & Noble. We've got books in any language. If you name it, we probably have that language. Eric, name a language. Filipino. That's what yep. I was going to say. I'll say Faroese. Really? Yeah, I was. Wow. You read my mind. That oh. was amazing. Wow. From, Kazakh. from a different from a different. Oh, like, that's a good one. Zone. Kazakh is a good one. Uh, Hebrew. Know. The first one I always think of Hindi. is French. Like, always. And uh. I don't know why, but I never say it because I'm like, that's ah, too common. <laughs> but there is Harry Potter in French. So many different versions of Harry Potter in French. Mm-hmm. And we have most of them, which is pretty wild. Um, it is. We do. Well, and you know what else we have a lot of? We have a lot of knowledge, at least in the hive mindset. <laughs> like, between the three of us and the people we know and the people in our Discord, we know a lot about Harry Potter books, which is very helpful, I think. Yeah. Uh, it's very helpful. Um I don't know if the people that are listening to this know, but um, Eric, Carly, and I, more so Eric and Carly than me, I kind of take like a bit of a backseat on it, but we're pretty involved in Facebook groups of people. That tends to be where a lot of people ask for information on their Harry Potter books, Um, and Carly and Eric are super, super on top of any posts to kind of give information, and that's kind of what this episode is going to be about today. So, um, this is season three, episode 40 of our podcast. Um, and this is going to be like a bit of an informational episode on, you know, stuff about your Harry Potter books. Like if you're holding your Harry Potter book from when you were like a little kid and you were reading this book and you want to know if it's worth anything, we got you covered. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but before We've done we, a few episodes on this. I think this is just have. more like a, this is just more directly addressing that question. And yeah, US we want books it to be that, like, like very specific. Yeah, and this is specifically going to be about U.S. books, not Canadian books, not U.K. books. And just some simple just tips, American like if you're out at books. a thrift shop or an estate sale, and you're like, "Hmm, there's a Harry Potter book. I wonder if it has any value." They will give you some really quick things that you can check really fast that you can hopefully remember pretty easily. Yeah, I I love doing these like resource episodes. I know I did one for like one of our bonus episodes. I tried to do just like a list episode where it's here's me. I'm going to list all of the books that are on my list. I'm going to list all of the pre-movie font books and I'm going to list all of these books, whatever books. And I want it to be a concise informational spot where you could just listen to this for five minutes and you could pick up and understand um, a little bit more about your personal collection um, because... You know, knowledge is power. Um, First, we're going to get into a little bit of news. So, news for today... Um, to kind of piggyback a little bit off of what we were talking about last week or two weeks ago, because we've, we've been doing it this every other week thing. It's, it's a last new episode is a safe way last to say that. Last episode now. in our previous episode, previously on Dialogue Alley. Previously on Dialogue Alley. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we were talking about um, the Hallmark ornaments because I was so stoked about the fact that I now have the complete set so far. Um, they have previously come out with one th- books one through five. They do a new one every year. And this year's book 
is Half Blood Prince, and Eric, have you gotten it yet? You or didn't you order it? Right. I get it for Christmas every year, so I may or may not already have it. I already have it. It, it arrived. There's a Hallmark <laughs> box sitting over there that I'm not allowed to look in. So it's here. Rita was on it. We were on our. Uh, we went to a wedding last weekend on the North Shore up by Lake Superior, and on the way back, I was like, "Rita, did you know this ornament came out?" And she like, it's like, oh, okay, well, let me look. Yeah, she's like, well, that's pretty amazing. Like, did it. But yeah, but get it now. I mean, like, it's not like they sell out. No, now. you could, like you, you don't could have typically to get, get it, it now. You could typically get it like now through the season, but I will say, like, once the season's over, you really can't get them anymore. Um, right. So if you if you collect these, if you want them, get it now. It's go to I the know, Hallmark I, store, go to Hallmark.com, and just get it. It's not; they're not even that expensive. No, I well, they're like eighteen dollars. I feel like for a little piece of plastic, like that's kind of expensive, but. Right, but for I don't know. Rather eighteen dollars than six hundred dollars. Craziness. And there's um, only seven, only seven books. So you're only spending eighteen dollars seven times if you've bought them at retail. You're price. right. You're right. I mean, I got a coupon in the mail for my birthday from a store. We have a store here called the Paper Store, which they like sell. Oh, Hallmark, I love the Paper Hallmark, Store. Hallmark, Hallmark ornaments. I couldn't. I don't know. I couldn't get that out of my mouth. Um. But I got a 20% off coupon for the store, so I'll, I might stop there and see if I can pick the ornament up while my coupon is active. I mean, this is definitely not on the scale of the new Haunted Mansion ornament. Have you seen this? <laughs> um, I think I did see it. I'm it's pretty like sure It's like the mansion, it. and then you can buy like little pieces from the yeah. mansion, like the ghost and like the coffin that's like, mm-hmm. let me out of here. And then you can buy like the Madame Leota seance crystal ball, and then you can buy like the... The That's hall really cool. with the ghost dancing. And it, your, like, main mansion, which is the tree topper, knows that those ornaments are on the tree, so they, like, interact with each well, other. Um, but we have that. That's if you're... The, the, we have the Hogwarts Castle tree topper that knows what ornaments you have on the tree. And if yeah, you have it's not Harry, it's not like a Hermione new concept, Ron. but this, no. one's, this one's about the Haunted, Haunted mansion, mansion from Disney. Yeah. Well, if you like that concept, they do have Harry Potter ones of that. So you could do the same thing, but make it Harry Potter if you wanted to. Ha ha ha. Um, and then, Eric, why don't you share our other bit of news? Oh, so the Women's World Cup just started. Uh, today's July 20th. And this is weird date-wise because the Women's World Cup is in New Zealand and Australia. So I don't really know the actual dates of things because we are like not the same time zone at all um but in the past for both men's and women's world cups and for the european championships i've always posted books um with covers from countries that are participating in the world cup and various international soccer tournaments with the scores i'm not going to do that for the women's world cup simply because i will not be at my house for like half of the women's world cup i'll be in europe so um I didn't want to just like start it and then have to come home and have to catch up on all of that. So kind of disappointed that I'm not going to be doing that because I really enjoy doing that, especially um, like picking out covers for like six English speaking countries and I have to assign them all a cover. Like it's just a fun little uh, little side project. And, and I don't know, I, I, I'd rather if, if I was home and able to do that. Like, great, but I'm not going to be home, so I'm not going to attempt it. So if you were looking forward to that, I'm sorry. Um, you'll have to wait till the next um, international competition, I suppose. Womp womp. womp I like womp. it. I always love when you do that. So I'm... I I'm, do too. I will say I'm slightly bummed, but the show must go on. You could do it, Melanie. Do you know how inactive I am on my Instagram? I check my Instagram. When people send me messages, I check my Instagram. And other than that, that's like pretty much it. I just I am I am not I am not good at Instagramming anymore. I I'm I'm growing up, you guys. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's what's happening. But I, I don't know. I just don't know. I don't know why I'm not super into Instagram, but I just I can't I just can't do it. It's because you have a kid and you're married and you have stuff going on and it, work responsibilities point, and some, are like and wild. sometimes you're just like you know what that stuff's more important than posting a picture of 
the food I'm eating. I think it's like the pressure for That's me okay. too. It's like trying to figure out like new stuff to post, new ways of posting it, like feeling like I'm posting the same things over and over again. Like I just feel like it's like a lot of pressure where I used to just like terribly just like enjoy it. Like I I loved posting on Instagram and it was something I was so passionate about. And now it's just like, I don't know why I'm just not into it. Well, I think I having this podcast though too is is just a different out out mm-hmm. like outlet for that where I'm still talking about things that I would be posting about on Instagram but I'm able to just talk about them. Yeah, a thousand so. percent. I feel like this is where this is where I like feed my my passion with Harry Potter stuff, but I don't know, like truth be told and this is like a Melanie being real moment like it's not like my passion for Harry Potter like ever really wavers. It's always going to be like a huge part of me, who I am and like what I do. But I don't know. Like, I feel like it's definitely like taking a back seat and stuff. Like I haven't I usually listen to the books on repeat. Now my husband kind of does it like um, I, I feel like I haven't done like a full series reread in like at least a year or so, which is like. I know Eric is doing like a gasping face, which like get because out. it seems no, but unheard I get of. That. But like, I like I'm listening that. to Lord of the Rings for fully for the first time um, because it was recently the the audiobook was recently redone like a couple of years ago. So um, I'm listening to that right now. I am enjoying it so immensely, and I feel like it's also making me want to listen to Harry Potter again because. I'm enjoying it and I'm enjoying the audiobook. But I I don't know. I don't know. I I love doing this podcast with you guys. That's that's like the bottom line of it that just like it feeds my my Harry Potter bookness. I don't know. That got way deeper than it needed. It got way deeper <laughs> than it needed to get. Sorry everybody. Well, we but could but- continue talking about the books though by talking about some books. Ooh. Why don't we do that? I think we should. I think we should talk about some books. I'm okay. ready. All right. So we kind of addressed it a little bit. What we're going to be doing today is we're going to be discussing, and we've, like we said earlier, we've already kind of talked about it, but we're going to talk about it a bit more. The U.S. books and what's valuable, what's not, because we, like Melanie mentioned a bit ago, um, me and Eric and Melanie, we're all a part of different uh, collector groups, on Harry Potter collector groups on Facebook, and we see a lot of questions pop up of, I found this book, is it valuable? I found this book, is it valuable? And quite frankly, a lot of the times the books aren't, at least out of the U.S. ones and some of the U.K., but also it's just it's just a common enough thing that I think we need to address it here again. Well, and I think providing more information that's just like the answer is no, your book's not valuable. That sometimes comes across as a little harsh, like harsh. I feel like we feel um, bad. Like I feel, I bad, feel bad being like. I feel like people see Harry Potter and they're like, oh, my God, it's a Harry Potter book, so it's valuable. Like, just because it's a Harry Potter book doesn't mean it's valuable. At the same time, my Harry Potter books, my personal Harry Potter books that were my first Harry Potter books that I read as a little kid are priceless to me. Right. But that doesn't make them valuable. And there's also kind of a a cinema, like the words collectible and valuable are being used synonymously and something may be very collectible. It may not be very valuable. So I think we need to kind of untie those a little bit because you can certainly have lots of things that are collectible, like the Hallmark ornament that just came out. It's collectible right now. It's still worth $18 because it just came out. Doesn't have a value yet. You know, or like the first edition point. Harry Potter books that you can still buy at Barnes and Noble, brand new set wise. You know, they're collectible. A lot of people want to collect the full set, but they're still in print. And most of the time they're not super valuable, which is what we're going to get into a little bit more now. 
Um, I think what I wanted to start with with this topic before we go into the books, I think we're we're going to talk about first the the American books that are valuable. Um, but that's a very small number. And compared to some of the books in the United Kingdom by the original publisher, Bloomsbury, um, you hear a lot more stories out of the UK that go something like this. Like, oh, woman in Sussex found Harry Potter book in grandma's attic and turns out to be worth 76,000 right. pounds. Right? Like... Or, you know, man buys book at thrift shop in Manchester, sells it for 125,000 pounds. Or, or even like, you'll see these clickbait headlines like, is your Harry Potter book worth something? And usually Most the information of, in, in that is wrong. It's usually wrong, but usually the also answer is, the other answer is, if you have a UK book, maybe you should click on it and find out. But if you're an American and you have American Harry Potter books... Most of the time, to the to the question, is your Harry Potter book worth something? Like, money-wise, not like priceless to Melanie's heart, like this is my childhood <laughs> copy. Most of the time, the answer is no. It's not worth anything. It's worth the price of a new book at most. If it's a used book, it's worth the price of a used book. It's not worth money. And... Or at least that's a lot just not, of, yeah. At least a lot of them. And that's just not the case with some of the UK books. Like, there are some books that are so rare. Like, the very first 500, was it 500 hardcover copies that came out mm-hmm. in, in the UK? Like, those books, it, regardless of condition, are going to sell for tons of money. Yep. Like, like, in some cases, life-changing amount of money. None of the American books... Even the one that's valued the highest is never going to sell for a life-changing amount of money. And that's just – it's kind of depressing to, to say that out loud. It doesn't mean it's not going to sell for some money. But it's – you're never going to find an American Harry Potter book that is going to change your life by getting you $50,000. It's not going to happen. So, and, like, right off the bat, that's kind of like my, like, sad noise right. sound effect. And really fast, like, we're say. just talking about all the unsigned books. When you add in a J.K. Rowling signature, yeah. values do change. But, again, it's not going to be a life-changing amount of money. Like, I can't think of any U.S. signed Harry Potter book that would be just a boku of money. Like well, life life changing is a subjective term too. It like is. you know, maybe two thousand like, dollars would really help someone and that's that's totally fine. But like I'm I'm just we're comparing like it to fifty thousand dollars, sixty thousand like, dollars, and I can't think of right. any that'll be there. Even signed. Right. Nope, not even close. Not even close. No, so no, no. Why don't we Carly, why don't you take us through um kind of the rarest and most valuable American Harry Potter books? Like what do, what do we have and then like what's our What's our value for those typically? So what is rare and most valuable for the U.S. books are not the same typically. And you see that too. Um, We'll just start with the one that everyone knows so much about. We'll start with the first print, first edition, hardcover, Sorcerer's Stone. Of course, those are the books that were sold at, and we call it trade sometimes or trade edition. They're the ones that were, they've got prices on them. You bought them at Barnes & Noble or bookstores or you know target something like that um arguably between 30 and thirty-five thousand of these were made so in the grand scheme of things that's quite a bit and even if half of them were lost to time um that's still quite a bit left in circulation so there's a bit of these out which is why it's not uncommon to find them but there's still a lot of demand for them. So the price of these tends to be between, I would say 1,200 to 2,500 if absolutely perfect, unread, pristine, and I grade books very hard, so I never use the word perfect, but something along those lines would be what I would expect for that book. It is not the most rare though. Um, But if you, if you want to know if you have that book, Carly has a great, um, little guide on her website yeah, yeah. you can Don't. find it on my website too i feel like it's on melanie's website it's on a lot of websites and we've actually. talked about it's it on our podcast it's on the potter collectors as well and if you ask us you can shoot us there a message are and we'll really tell you. easy ways that yeah. you can tell whether it's 
this book or if it's an authentic version of this book. Um, and not a book club. Yeah, we can. We don't mind mm-hmm. helping with that one. Um, I think just people get excited when they open a book and they see the words first edition on them, which yeah. if it, it's the again, we've said this many times, if it is the original books one through seven art, Mary Grand Prey is the artist, like the art that you know and love. They're all going to be first editions. They're still printing those. You can go to Barnes and Noble and buy a first edition. It's the print number that, that matters. you want to look for. Right. And if you have a question about that, like, hey, what print number is it? That's a more appropriate question. Not is this a first edition? Because right. the chances are, yeah, it's a first edition. With the exception it, it, of there are book clubs that kind of screw things up a bit. They do, but I'm I'm more than happy to answer those questions. I think yeah. all of us are. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And they're asked quite a bit on the Facebook groups that we moderate and are a part of. Like, literally, there's so many threads where we are saying it's a book club, it's a book club, and here's how we know. So you could honestly probably Google, or not Google, but put in the search for those Facebook groups. You know how the Facebook groups have individual searches? You could probably put book club edition at this point, and it would pull up the places where we've said, you know, it's a a book club edition. And here's how we know. Yeah, that's a great idea. It's a great idea. Yeah. That search feature is often looked over, but it is very useful for stuff like this. Like if you have any concern and you're part of a Harry Potter Facebook group, there's a decent chance that one of the three of us may be there if it's got a a decent number of members because we're a part of quite a few or have been a part of quite a few different collector groups. And most of it, you know, we're pretty active in them from time to time. So um, use the search feature. Um... And again, we're talking about misinformation. If the information doesn't jive with what you've heard, either us saying, Peter saying, my YouTube video saying, Melanie's website, my website, or other things, chances are it's wrong. Okay. Um, So you always have to... what. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say you always have to look at the information that you're reading and make sure that it jives with what the group opinion is. Because in this case... The group actually, like, we know quite a bit as a group. Yeah, I love the hive mindset. If there's a question that we don't know the answer to, we usually know someone that would know right. the answer, which is really helpful. But so the book Carly just mentioned, first printing, first edition of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, um, American version. The, in great condition, you're looking at maybe 2,500 tops. I would not. Like, I mean, in, great condition would be like high. fine. I would say fine, and it would be absolutely like a unicorn book, completely unread, no creasing on the jacket, The there's no fading on the red spine, the, the corners are still sharp, like it looks absolutely brand new the day, like it left just the printer, the publisher, that kind of thing. So maybe $2,500, and even then, that's hopeful. That's kind of a stretch. I don't think I've ever seen one sell that high. I have. I is- have. You I've have? seen you them. Have? I've seen them sell, sell for three thousand or so, but this was, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a unicorn book. I've yeah. seen wrong ones sell for too much money on eBay for roughly that for people thinking that they were getting something special and they were getting a twenty fifth print. And I wanted to email the buyer, but that's neither here nor there. Um, oh, yep. All right. So what do we got next in this kind of? We have, one, we have like four big categories have, yeah. of things that are like quote worth money. This then is our like maybe over a thousand dollar category. And so, so I'm spending a little bit more time here because this is where the money is, right? And it's yeah. what the people want to know. Um, and then we have, as far as like the most rare, that's up for debate because we have the Junior Library Guild edition of Sorcerer's Stone as well as the Advanced Reader copy. I'm going to say the Junior Library Guild is more rare than the Advanced Reader copy because arguably it's been in circulation that there are about 3,000 of those that were made. So again, not rare as far as proofs go either, right? 3,000 is a fairly big number and they are around. Um, It's just demand is high so the prices stay pretty inflated. Um, So we'll cover Junior Library Guild Edition and that's been a tots on our show before. We've talked about it. I've made a YouTube video about it. There's a lot of information out there. I think it, it, I covered it on my website, although I'm going to be honest and just say now that I've got my books back, I can finally start updating things, but it, I haven't updated in about two years. Um, but the, I think all you need, all you need to know about this book and like, is, do I have this book is like, you look at the spine and if the bottom of the spine 
It Instead says Junior saying, Library like, Guild. Scholastic, it says Junior Library Guild. Like, if and your spine tag, doesn't say well, that, you don't have it. And there's a tag on the back of the cover and the jacket that also says Junior Library Guild. And so it and it looks like a well-made book club because it's exactly what it is. And it has the Guardian quote, which is why collectors are like, oh, Guardian quote kind of thing. And it's got the pictorial boards. Um, and then we have the yeah, advanced. But in terms of do I have it, that's. Super easy. Yeah. Look at the spine. Does it say Junior Library Guild? If not, no, you don't have it. Yeah, Sorry. and those range in value quite a bit. You find them a lot more well-worn than fine condition. So that's kind of whatever the market wants to bear. They're they're not common at all. Um, but they do show up in places from time to time. Um, then we have the Advanced Reader Copy or ARC sometimes. I don't know. I would say maybe $1,000. It's a soft cover Mary Grand Prix boards, or not even boards, Mary Grand Prix wraps. And it says advanced reader copy at the bottom. So They're that cool. one, that, they are fun. They rub really easily, so they do wear really mm-hmm. easily, unfortunately. Um, and they do have a fun little letter from Scholastic Publisher in there that's bound into them that, that explains the book and what they've done. And I think that's cool. Um, and those but again, are... that's super, e- super easy, though. Do yeah. I have an advanced reader copy? Like, does it say that at the bottom of the cover? <laughs> right. Because it's it not going to be just no, any soft cover book, right? It's going to be no, very it's... specially marked. And you know when you have one. Like, Right. It's going to say advanced reader's edition at the bottom. And then the back is going to say uncorrected proof not for sale exactly. in a giant purple rectangle. And it's rectangle. got that big... Like, it's yeah. very noticeable. Right. Um, and those sell for... I mean, you can pick them up sometimes for four fifty. They generally tend to sell for nine fifty to, I would say, fourteen hundred. I think fifteen hundred is really pushing it. Um, just because it would have to be completely fine, and they're hard to find in that condition because they they were uncorrected proofs sent out to the media. When Carly says fine, that's not like it's okay. Fine right. is like it's flawless, in perfect condition. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> flawless. Terms. Yeah. Like, girl, um, you fine. Yeah, I'm using yeah. actual Ooh, book grading book terms fine. at this point. Not yeah. like, very good. <laughs> no, it's not just okay. It's like the most perfect book you've seen ever kind of thing, right? Um, but those are going to be the ones that have the most value. Even if you're going to look at the ARCs of, because there's two other ARCs, books one, or books two and book three both have them, and they are not nearly as high a value, right? Um, no, I would, so... so- I think that's a good summary, though. The three books that are worth the most from the United States of America are all Sorcerer's Stone books. That's it. Right. There's nothing right. else. There's Sorcerer's Stone books. There's one that you might be like, do I have a first print first edition? We can answer questions. Two, do I have a junior library guild? Does it say that on the spine? No? Okay. Or yes? Hooray. <laughs> Three, does it say advanced reader's edition on the front and have a thing that says not for sale on the back? Yeah. Yeah. Great. No? Eh. Like right. really Very easy. easy tells for right. like two of those three is like super easy tells. Yep. 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 And then moving on, you know, we've have like the category that I would say is a hundred to five hundred dollars. Um, I think one of the cool books in this category is the Order of the Phoenix Book Expo edition. It's from the 2004 um, Book Expo of America. It was the it's a really neat book and a five thousand of them were made like this book should be more valuable than it is, in my opinion. I feel like they've been going up lately, though. They have like, been. I I've, feel like people are finally catching on. Yeah. I I feel like this past year, that book has... I, and I'm like, I almost want to like pat, her, pat us on the back about it. And I'm like, maybe it has something to do with us. Because we talk about this book a lot. And we do. It's an amazingly like beautiful and underrated book. And the fact that there are only 5,000 of them, it's so yeah. cool. I think it should be worth more. I agree. It was featured. It was given away with the sh- at the show. It doesn't have any writing on it. It has a different cover. It has, you know, if you have this book because it has the deluxe edition U.S. hardcover like wraps from the deluxe edition. Yeah. That jacket is the cover of this soft cover book, and there's no writing on it. It just says Scholastic and red. That's it. So you have this great unmarred version with the art that's a soft cover. It's the same size as the soft covers, but it's the deluxe edition. Mary Grand Prix cover art. So that's how you know if you have that one. And there's no price on it because it was not open for sale to the public. So there's no barcode. 
you know, and it was not, sometimes it's confused with an advanced reader copy. It is not that. It came afterward right. um, by about a year. But still a really cool book. And that one, we like what Melanie was saying, I remember buying my copy, I think, for 60 bucks back in 2015. They were just kind of slid I under the radar. From, I bought mine from you for 50 bucks. Yeah. It, they slid under the radar for so long. And that I would just nab them up when I found them because I could find them sometimes for, you know, 30 40 $50. Um, sixty dollars seventy five, and they were all in in reasonably good, very good plus condition, depending. Um, and now I'd say they're selling for closer to two to three, sometimes higher. So that's good. Like yeah. I'm glad to actually see yep, that book paid, getting some traction. I paid traction. for on that for mine pretty yeah. recently. So I'm glad I would to see that book getting be in traction. Line with that price. Yeah, me too. So I'm good job, guys. It. Good job. <laughs> and then we have the, um. Let's see. What the else? Scholastic, Scholastic School, School Market. Market one of our favorite covers. We talk about this one quite a bit as well. That one it has a different cover entirely. It's also a Sorcerer's Stone book. It has a totally different cover. It was only available for the 2008 Scholastic School Market deal. It's where Scholastic would have these book fairs, and they sold this book. It had a different cover. And it's the only time this cover was available. It is still Mary Grand Prey, but it's not the cover we know and love, and it is really cool. Um, There's an easy tell at the top of this book. It says, right on the front, exclusive Scholastic School Market Edition. Yep, yep, How about yep. the fact that it is the only book with that cover art? There is the no other one also in this, a pretty on this easy planet tell. with that cover art. <laughs> yep. So if you have that, that's kind of a dead giveaway. It's a um, cool book. What else do we have? Is it value for that? Um, oh, geez. I would say... I feel I like would, it fluctuates uh, a lot. It does. I would say anywhere between 75, 100 to 2, 250. A lot of the times, though, they're not... They weren't warehoused well. So a lot of the wear that you see on these was because they weren't stored well before they were sold to the public. Because a lot of these wound up not being read. Like and I have well, had, and oh. they were moved around. If they were book fair books, like they would be mm-hmm. boxed up, shipped out to right. a book fair. Kids would pick them up on the shelf, be like, "Hey, look, this book," and then they'd put it back and not buy it. And then at the end of the book fair, they'd pack them all up and, and do ship it again them on to another school. So, like, even though they were new and never purchased, they still got handled a lot by people, and boxed up and unboxed multiple right. times. So there's yeah, there's wear on these books because of that's that. just how. And they weren't they available were in the market the for very market. long for whatever reason. So, you know, but it's a cool book to have. Very cool book to have. Um, What else? We have the Chamber of Secrets hardcover first edition, first print, first state, because there are arguably three of these. And we can talk about that later. And I think I've made a YouTube about it. And I think it's on my website. If not, it needs to be. Um. Well, I don't even know if we have to cover it here because in terms of value... No, we're not going to cover it in this They're just there in this still podcast. isn't much value. No, right. we're not going to cover it in this podcast because exactly what Eric said. It's just neat to have all three. Someone I know and love, like myself, has all three. Arguably we all We should three. just do an episode on that. I think that'd be interesting. Um, yes, but in, that book for me is hard to value, but it's still going to be right around $100, maybe less. There are people that are like, oh, it has the rare Sorcerer's Stone error. For those that don't know, they misspelled Sorcerer's Stone on the also by page. Um, Sorcerer is misspelled. And it's really misspelled. And it's funny, but it adds no value. So, you know, I would say maybe $100. I would have a hard time paying more than that myself. Because they are around. There were 275,000, 275,000, which is a huge number, first prints of these guys. So they're around. Okay. And then if you add in the other states, arguably those came later and timeline stuff, which we can get into later. So there are arguably more first prints than that around. They're around. You can find them. So I would say if you spend more than 100, it better be a unicorn book, basically. I think that's fair. Right? Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm looking on eBay for that one now. I'm like, oh, I don't, I'm like, I don't have one of those, actually. You'll see them That's on eBay cool. sometimes. You'll see any of the hardcover Sorcerer's Stone, and they're like, rare, misprint, error, $2,500. Like, but like, no. even this, like, this picture is like a, it says, true first print, but 
Oh, maybe it is. I mean, eh, maybe. Um, I'll add it to my watch list. Yeah. And then we'll chat about this. We'll we'll chat about this off air. Fabulous. A fabulous. Um, so I guess there are two more that we can, I guess, just round out this scale yeah. on that I don't think necessarily are that valuable either. But they're also just very easy to tell what book it is. They are the collector's editions of only collector's editions were made of books one and two. They came in the acetate covers with the pleather binding and they weren't well made. So if you have one, it could be showing problems. Like mine fell off and the it, shelf and the cover fell off. So that was fun. I actually know several not, other people. Yeah, they're just that not that made well. Too. And if you don't have the clear Acetate cover, cover that goes yeah. over the book, yeah, if you don't have it, like it's clear, but there's words on it. So like the words are printed in white and they show up on the dark cover of the actual book. Mm-hmm. So if you don't have it, you're missing part of the book. It's not like. So to me. That takes like all the value out of that book if you don't have the. Well, it's plastic like buying a jacket, a book cover. without the yeah. jacket. It's the right. same that's idea. Say. That's the right. jacket. So yeah, that's the jacket. You need that, and and it did. That the, one did very of these easily. Situ- well, yeah, and it, like in all of these books that we're talking about, if they're not complete, yeah, like they're not. The value goes down like, incredibly. Right, because like, collectors want, want the whole shebang. Also, the collectors' editions are famously because Joe signed a cartoon, and they are famously so, um, sold as signed because of that ha- that uh, machine signed or auto pen signed cartoon in there. So it's not. I do know of signed copies, but most of them aren't it. I promise. Just like the U.S. deluxe books. Yep. So I guess to recap, if you have a Deathly Hallows book, if you have a Half-Blood Prince book, if you have a Goblet of Fire book. Order of the Phoenix. Well, Order of the Phoenix is Order of the Phoenix the has the Expo, Expo edition. That's, yeah. that's its saving grace, I guess. So, But I'm saying if you have a oh, Deathly yeah. Hallows book, a Half-Blood Prince book, or a Goblet of Fire book, it's not worth anything. No. Like, unless besides, it's signed. Unless it's signed. It's just not... It, it's not worth more than ten dollars, twelve dollars, twenty dollars, and that's a in really condition. good condition, right? Even the yeah, first prints of these not... books, you can find them for like Erica saying ten to fifteen, twenty bucks. Yeah, so I frequently get asked about. Well, I just have a hardcover full set of the U.S. books, and they're none, they're none of them are any of these like valuable books. What's a full set of Harry Potter books worth? hardcover well it's surely not worth more than you could just go to the store and buy it for right because you could go to the store and buy brand new copies of these books um i frequently see these if you go to facebook marketplace there are always people selling a full one through seven hardcover harry potter for like set uh, for like 30 50 40 dollars yeah 50 30 40 like, 50 60 yeah like they're 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 in that range like 50 bucks plus or minus 20 um, sometimes they'll even throw in like the Quidditch Through the Ages book or Fantastic Beasts or Cursed Child. They'll throw an extra book in. There's a an eBay seller I found um, where like you for like twenty five dollars you can just get a full seven book set and they just get pick seven random books from their giant warehouse and bundle them together and mail it to you. Like they're reading copies. Most of the American books are reading copies, which means. You get the book so that you can read it or someone else can read it. Um, that's that's just the market of the American books, unfortunately. It's just not – it's not a gold mine. It's not necessarily a, a treasure trove, which is, I guess, just a synonym for gold mine. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you're not going to make – you're not going to make a lot of money on selling U.S. books. You, you're just not unless you have some of the very, like, higher priced ones that we just mentioned – and even even those are not worth that much. And it's really obvious if you have one of those, with the exception of maybe a first first Sorcerer's Stone. Um, but you, you just have to remember, like, the books came out in the UK first. They were popular. They came out here second. How many more people live in the United States than the United Kingdom? It's a significantly right. bigger country in terms of population. So even though they didn't know this book was going to be super popular... An initial print run in the U.S. is just by nature going to be bigger 
than an initial print run in the United Kingdom because we have so many more people that live here. And they and so, Arthur Levine had a feeling that, you know, from book one on, that this was going to be a special book. So that's why the first print, first edition of Sorcerer's Stone was so much. And that's also partially one of the reasons why we have so many different book clubs for book one is he was just trying to get the word out because by getting it into the book clubs, then people are subscribers to the book clubs and then they, they'll they read it because it's a book of the month or whatever it is, or Oprah's book club or whatever book clubs this was a part of. So it, it was a way to get it the book around, but they don't have a lot of value for the most part with the exception of the JLG. Um, but just kind of a neat thing. Like, neat part of the publishing history, but not necessarily valuable. Collectible. I know people that do collect those. Like, I actually collect the book club editions because I think they're fun and I can pick them up for five bucks. And if nothing else, I can be like, oh, you mean this one right here. But there's not yeah. value to it. Yeah. So, I guess at the end of the day, like, I don't like saying to people, your book is not valuable. But 99% of the time, it's not. And that's just a fact because of how many books are printed in the United States and the fact that they're still printing first editions now. Like you can go buy one at Barnes and Noble or Target. Like Or the park. They're there. But you can find one in a little free library at your park mm -hmm. and just take it home and read it. Or I was talking so, about Orlando, but also that. <laughs> oh yeah. Or yeah, Orlando too. So they're there. Um and that's kind of the rundown of the value. I think that was pretty good. Yeah. There are some there are definitely some cool books from the United States that are like just cool to have and are valuable, but it's not yeah. anywhere near to the no, like news stories really and clickbait okay. articles yeah. where someone's made hundreds of thousands of dollars or, or or British pounds. Well, I, I a, saw one article a book they that, dug up in someone's attic that said um, a first print, first edition of Sorcerer's Stone was like valued at almost seven thousand dollars, and I was like, um, "Where? <laughs> in what yeah, world?" It's it's hard, and people will say, "Well, I've looked on eBay, and I've seen people asking this price. People ask ridiculously high amounts of money for books that we've just talked about, mm -hmm. or books that we didn't even talk about that are just commonplace books that had." over a million of them printed yeah and they're still like it's a first edition i want you know two thousand dollars for this book it's just not worth that no and people can list things for whatever they want on ebay and people that don't do research can buy them so there are some in the sold listings and that but it doesn't, doesn't create mean the value a market is that. it no. doesn't create a market for it if we do have some really rare books that are hard to value like you know the Asturian, let's say, the Asturian translation of book one. That's harder to value because there's 700, very few sell, and they certainly usually don't sell in the open market. So it makes it harder to to put a market value on because there's really not a market for it. We know what the market value is for a first print, first edition Deathly Hallows. It's around $20. That's what the average is that these sell for, give or take, unless there's a weird feature like it's signed or something like that. That changes the value drastically. Otherwise, the market tends to stay around 20 bucks. They're around. And they're just not valuable. No, they're not. A lot of these books, if you brought them to half price books, they wouldn't even pay you for them. They would just no, say, thanks get, for your donation. They get so many <laughs> of them. So it's most of the time that's the case. Not to say that you could find something really exciting, but if it is exciting, you can usually tell because the American books will say on the front that it's exciting. Right. They're pretty, they're pretty big about that. Advanced yep. reader copy on the, on the front, you probably have one. Chances yep. are that's exactly what it is. And talking about cool books, let's get into our tots. Okay, so for the translation of the show, we're sticking with the theme here. We're going to talk about a book that I have very vivid memories of, and it's uh, the American Scholastic Edition hardcover of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. 
Hooray. This is one of my favorite Whoa. covers, by the by. Really? Because it's not one of mine. It is. I think it's the green, if I'm being honest. I'm such a green person. It's also one of my favorite Harry's. I feel like. Yes, it's a great Harry. It's a good Harry. Harry on the front. Yeah. This particular yep. Harry is what I think it's my favorite Mary Grand Prix Harry, without a doubt. Um, oh, OK. I don't know. I can't say that without a doubt. I take that back. But it's. I'm going to say today it's my favorite. <laughs> I would say out of the seven trade first editions, it's probably my favorite, Harry. I agree with Melanie there. Out of the seven, it's definitely my favorite. But then when I start thinking about, like, the 10th anniversary edition. I know. When you start adding in other books like that or, like, the Scholastic yeah. School Market, it gets fuzzy. But of the it's seven my favorite. books... It might be my favorite Mary Grand Prix. Yeah, it's my favorite Mary Grand Prix, Harry, I think. Wow, okay. I went really confident to not so confident. <laughs> That's today, okay. Today it's my we favorite. We can change our minds. Thank you. Um, so if you're new to this section of the show, what we do is we take usually a translation. So we'll take like, hey, this book in French or this book in Finnish or German or Swedish or Slovak. And we will rate it based on... Um, things like how it smells, the size and proportions, the um, the quality of the book, any sort of like X factor, things that jump out at us. And we rate them by giving them a score from the OWL rubric. So the highest being outstanding, followed by exceeds expectations, A for acceptable, uh, P for poor, D for dreadful, and T for troll. Um, and it's rare that we get to do this for American books. So I know. I'm actually kind of excited. Um, because these are just the books that we read. Like, this is my copy of Goblet of Fire that I read for the very first time to experience the story. And now I get to, like, I'm critique I'm actually it. really excited to put this on the tot scale. Like, because we don't usually do American hardcover books. Like, we have so many other books in our collections that we can pick other books. But <laughs> I'm actually really excited to put a Scholastic in the tots. To put it through the top yeah, scale. Yeah, I agree. I think we did this once before with um, when Tom was on the show. I think we did Half Blood Prince. I think we did. Uh huh. So yep. I'm excited to get into this. So there's no translator. It's the English version, um, but it was slightly adapted for American English. So there are things that were changed. The publisher of this book is Scholastic, and this is still an Arthur Levine like published book, also. Which now, if you go to the store, it won't say that on them anymore. But right. it's it's the same it's the same book. Um, I mean, they still say Scholastic. They don't say Arthur Levine. Um, general info on the language: it's English, American it's English, the original Woo. American English. I guess you don't need much more than that. But how did we get ours? This is interesting because this is still. I read this book in, I think I started in sixth grade, going to seventh grade, so. Like, I didn't go to the store and buy this. Someone bought it for me. Or it came in the mail. I don't remember how I got it. But maybe I got it from Amazon when it was just books. Amazon just sold books. Or I went to Barnes & Noble. I don't remember wow. how I got it. Someone if, gave it to me. Someone said, here, Eric. If it was back when Amazon like just Potter, sold books, that's... Fourth one's out. That's going back into history. Yeah, it is. I um, think, so that's how I got mine. My I parents probably gave it to me. I think mine's from Borders. I think my brother got it from Borders way back. So that was before... Before Borders was a thing. This is from eBay. I needed a I needed a first edition Goblet of Fire. <laughs> so you gotta do what you gotta do. I you think gotta do what you yeah, gotta do. yeah. It was it was a weird deal, but it's from eBay. Nothing special. So then I think value on this book. This is the hardcover Goblet of Fire Mary Grand Prix book. Um, mine is a first edition, first printing. Mine! Because they made too. a ton of these. Yeah, there were like 400 and something thousand first prints. This it's one insane. is a 13th print. Ooh, way to go. From 2004. So to, to give you an idea, they were in the 13th print by 2004. Like, that's really pretty cool. Like, that just that shows how cool. popular. Because this was when Potter Mania was really setting in. Um, book five had come out in 03. And so people were, you know, buying them up, you know, really getting into the series. I miss those days. Oh, I just got nostalgic. <laughs> I know. This book has a lot of nostalgia. I think of all of the books, I have the most nostalgia for this book. Well, this particular is the book. first 
I when I got into Harry Potter, all that were out were one through four. So like, I remember finishing this book. After, it was my sister's book at the time. I remember reading the Goblet of Fire, and I was like. I must have more. And she was like, "There's, we have to wait. And I was like, what? <laughs> what do you mean, Yeah, this wait? was the first one that I waited for. I Like, when I read one through three, those were all out. Um, and this was the first one I had to be like, well, I got to wait for book four. So Gosh. here it is, first printing, first edition. Value of mine that I'm holding, which it's in pretty decent shape, actually, for being a book that I read as a kid. Um, I mean, 20 bucks max, maybe? It's I just would not. S- yeah. As my grandy would say, since mine is a 13th print, I'd say it's worth about a plug nickel. So what anyone wants to pay for it, <laughs> like it's, five bucks. I guess you can't put a money, a monetary value, but like it's worth what you would pay to read this book. Yeah. I think that's what I would, that's, what I I would say. I actually call it the readability. If you, it's worth what the readability of the book is to you. So like what you would pay to read the book. So I would say like if you want no more than five. If you want a nice, like, hardcover copy of this to put in your collection and keep on your shelf, um, and you would probably want a first printing, you might spend $20, $30 to just seek one out. But if you want just, like, a really good condition of this book and you don't care about the printing, go to the store and buy a brand new one. For right. I will say the brand new ones, they have revamped something. the cover, co- the colors on the cover, so they're a lot more vivid. I can definitely tell. They are more yeah, vivid. I can tell a difference between old and new cover by the color. Um, uh, oh, where they put a lot of color in, where it, and it's not. I forget what it's called. It's not density. The saturation. <laughs> saturation. Saturation. Not, not shrubberies. <laughs> Silly. There are a lot of shrubberies on this book. <laughs> it is the color saturation. There's a lot more color saturation in the newer editions. Okay, so let's get into giving this a score. So again, not a valuable book. It's just not any... I No versions of Goblet of Fire are valuable in the United States, unfortunately. Sad face. Uh, but unsigned they are out. valuable to us. Yeah. What? We're taking unsigned out. Like, I just have to reiterate oh, yeah. that. But Yep, 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 yep. Um, so the first thing we do is we open the book and we smell it. So what do you give it, everybody? I'm going to give it a good smell. Here's a new thing I want to do. Being all three of us have the books now, I want to know what page you guys opened up to. Oh, like when oh you just I'm on page uh, 272, the chapter 17. Uh, 394. Ooh, 388. Carly, we were close. That Look means we us. win. This this means nothing. I was just curious. I think that's good. That's a little, it's a little fun fact. Everyone loves fun facts. Ooh. It is fun. I like it a lot. I really like the smell of this book. I just wish that it smelled more of this smell that I'm smelling. It's so good. And it's unlike anything else. I need to like give it a rest for a little while, but like I would give it like an definite exceeds expectations plus like it's it smells like so sweet. It's probably like I agree with you. It's one of, you know what? one of the it's, better smelling books. It's because I probably like read this at camp, like in the cooking room, like while I was making like cinnamon bread or something like that. Like that's what it reminds me of. Oh, monkey bread. We called it monkey bread. It was like, love, yeah, we have monkey I, bread here. That's a thing. I, yeah, same yeah. here. I made it for Steve not too very long ago. So mine smells really terrible toward the top of the spine, but the more I go down, it smells wonderful. So yeah. Melanie E plus, I'm giving it E plus. Carly, what are you what are you giving it? I'm gonna say acceptable by averaging out the top and the bottom, because the bottom okay. smells acceptable, like or exceeds expectations plus. Huh. I think that's probably closer to you guys. The top smells like it's been by a campfire and it's gotten mustily sweet. Gotcha. So that um, is not... It smells so sweet. That's, that's that like, smells sweet. I feel like Carly says that all the time. Like, oh, it has a sweet smell. And I never really understand what she's saying. This book smells sweet. Like, See? I'm not almost like cookies or... Yeah. I don't know. Oh, it's so good, though. I love this. I do love it. But you know what else I love? Tell me. Tell me what you love. Can't wait. The size and proportions. Ah! I actually really do love the size and proportions of this book. At the time... There were, there were news stories about how just massive this book was. And these little, you know, little kiddos are toddling around school with this huge book in their backpack. That was me. I mean, I was like 12, so I wasn't toddling around. But 
like toting this thing around. I remember going, my parents had some meeting with, I don't know, like, oh no, it was the meeting with the architect when they were building the house that we moved into. Um, and I like had to bring this along and sit on this person's couch, like in the like office area. And I just read this book and it was like, like carrying this thing around. I was like, I've never carried anything this big before, like, because I wanted to. It was always like, here's your math textbook, put it in your backpack. It's like, no, I want to bring it. I want to bring this book. Um, it's really big, but that doesn't mean that it's crazy. The U.S. books in general are very big. They are tall. They are wide. They're just beefy books. Yeah, and they are. They're like the cardboard's really thick. We'll talk about that in a little bit. They're just, in general, big books. But I do feel like the size and proportions of all of the American books are really good. Um, so, like, dare I say, I think this is an outstanding. It's a thick book, but I think it's just, it's just it's a phenomenal. Good, it's a good I know book. it's so good. I give this an O too. Like, I love everything about the size and proportions. It is a book's book, if that makes sense. I, I feel like this is the book that, like, I compare, like, other books to, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It sets the bar. This was, like, this was, like, the first biggest book that, like, I probably read with how massive and intimidating this book is. Um, but yeah. size and proportions, are, it is so, so outstanding. I agree. Which I agree. That's triple O for that. So then um, how it feels Ooh. in your hands, even though these books are big, and I, my hands are a little bit bigger. I, I feel like, I mean, my hands aren't small by any means. Um, but it's like as an adult, it doesn't it doesn't feel ridiculous to read it. Like no. it opens up really nicely. The, the spine doesn't really crease just the way that they've bound these books. Um, even though it's a massive book, typically the thicker the book is, the harder it is to read at the beginning or the end. I don't feel that for this book. It just opens and you can read it. Um, they have done. So I actually. Go on. Oh, I was, I, I'm also going to give this an outstanding for how it feels in your hands. I love the texture of the cover. All the American books have such a great texture on the jacket. Um, if you don't read it with the jacket, it, like and you have like the diamond pattern on the, the boards like that feels really good too it's very grippy you can grip it it's not going to fall out of your hand and the spine cloth and feels good like everything it's yeah, a nice it's tactile read um and i'm gonna go into that that's an outstanding for me as well i feel like the earlier like the books one through three are really prone to spineling the more they're read but by the time they got to book four, I don't know, their manufacturing processes, I think, much better in place because I don't see the spine leans that I saw with books one through three in the later books, even though they've been heavily read. And it's because like what Eric was saying, like it doesn't like it just opens. You can open it in your hand and read it. It's just a I prefer these honestly to the U.S. softcover books. If I'm reading a Harry oh, Potter book. Too. Yeah. If it's not an audio book, it is a hardcover. It is definitely a hardcover. I prefer these to the UK hardcover books, and it's oh, not even close. Agreed. Like, no. These agreed. books are made so well, which is awesome. I agree, and too. You can, I agree. You can tell because our next category is the quality. Like, they hold up so well. Like, I see pictures of books that are, like, battered, but they're still there, and they're the together, and, the and you can read them. Like, Pages don't fall out of these. Like, no. They, they're just... When they're there like i this book is very like i can tell i read this book like yeah. and i threw but it in backpacks and stuff like it's not in the best condition because i read it but it's still well like, really good and the first prints of these like what y'all have were made in 2000 so that's 23 years old for a book so if you could look at considering how much wear and tear like y'all consumed it pretty you know a lot you love the series you fell in love with the series you reread the series you read these books and they're holding up and not only that they held their shape i mean the jackets intact like i think that's excellent quality there i'd say outstanding yep. for I'm me i'm giving i'm giving it outstanding for quality yeah. for me i think it's fantastic melanie's well, gonna like crush <laughs> our hopes and dreams no now. here's what i'm gonna say is uh, let me go back because i didn't say how it felt in my hands Oh. oh, sorry, so, sorry. Thanks, we guys. got excited. Um, <laughs> sorry, I have my eye on the timer because I'm trying to keep this a con like. 
just All kidding. All right, Mr. and Miss, let's talk 50,000 hours for the main segment while Melanie sits here and tries to find gifts to send you guys that say wrap it up. Oh. That's what I'm going to say. Um, how the book, I'm going to just, it's an outstanding, um, how it feels in my hands. Quality also, oh, okay. uh, I'm going to give it an outstanding. And I'm saving my details for how it feels in my hand because that's going to be my X Factor. So I'm going to go first for X Factor because I don't want anyone to take mine. What's that? Well, okay, we'll let you go first for that. But before well, we're not that, up to we that need, yet. No, we're cover. not. Right, cover art. Um, I I don't think it's fair to say like interpretation of cover art because this, this is, is one of the two iconic covers of this book, the UK book. This and is the, the cover US that's book. interpreted. Are the yes, these are the right. two covers that came out. Um, this book came out at the exact same time as the UK book. Um, mm-hmm. This it's just very iconic image of this book. So. I, it's not my favorite cover. I don't need to go. We have a whole episode about that. I don't need to go into details why. But um, the fact that all the U.S. books have the, just the raised font that says Harry Potter. You know, it's got a little bit of, of shimmer mm-hmm. on there as well. The, it's got a matte finish. It's just the cover looks so great. You can take the jacket off and unfold it and it's one big image that's that you can do that for all of the american books that is so cool that you can do that it's one big picture i love the wraparound Um, cover art it's just great so like it's even though it's not my favorite of the american covers it's still to me it's outstanding like i love i just love it it's so iconic it's so just fun i remember we've talked about like what is the color gonna be of the of the foil part on the next book because you know we've had gold we've had silver we've had you know what, what's it gonna be and then like this one is like oh it's orange wow then the next one's like it's blue ah. um, yeah so yeah purple. Outsta- outstanding ah. for me yeah purple ah. i agree outstanding for all the things oh me yeah we're waiting, we're waiting. Yeah, you yeah couldn't be then oh. who <laughs> <laughs> i'm just teasing because of before um, I'm obviously I'm gonna give the cover art an outstanding, um, because it's my favorite Harry. I was saying that before, like this is my favorite Mary Grandpre Harry. Obviously, yeah. I wavered before, but I'm sticking to it. I always love this Harry. Um, and something that we've talked about in other episodes when we're talking about translations, the Mary Grandpre cover art kind of set the bar for a lot of other cover arts around the world, and um, a lot of them kind of like follow suit with what she did. So. Book four was really the first one where it's like Harry super zoomed in. And we see that in other countries as well. Um, I'm pretty sure Spanish was like one of the big ones where we talked about yeah, they started yeah. following suit with that. And I think that that's like super interesting. So this is really like that first book that it's not like a full body of Harry or Harry from like a distance. This is zoomed in. <laughs> this is the first book that it's, it's really just about Harry. And he just... His green eyes just absolutely captivate you in this cover. So it's obviously an outstanding. Uh, Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. (sighs) All right, Melanie, tell us about your X Factor. (gasps) My X Factor is, honestly, it's like how it feels in my hands. And this is something that I'm pretty sure was my X Factor when we talked about Half-Blood Prince as well. The fact that the texture of this jacket only almost feels like like Hagrid's leather jacket. Like an old, worn like piece of leather that just the more you touch it, the more you hold it, the more it just feels soft and supple. And like you want to hold this book in your hands because the more that you read it, the more that it like bends to you reading it, the more comfortable and soft this cover gets. And it, it's just a piece of magic that these U S books have that I feel like they don't, they don't recreate that kind of anywhere else. So that's my X factor. Mine is very easy. It's all the green. It's not half blood (laughs) prince green, green, but it's like, I love the green with like the bronze and the orange. Like it's so beautiful. The color palette used in that is just spot on for me. So that's mine. Um, Mine is going to be just the foil that's orange. I like it. I like orange. It's my favorite color. But I guess if I had to pick something else, I do like how in the U.S. books, the 
title of the book, it's, there's always the big Harry Potter at the, at the top, but the title of the book is always presented in some other way. So like it's in the archway in Sorcerer's Stone. It's on the wall of the Chamber of Secrets in mm-hmm. the style of the writing. Like Prisoner of Azkaban is kind of like a scroll. This one's like, it's a like a little banner sign like hung up. Like you would see someone holding this up at the Triwizard Tournament, like cheering someone on. So um, I like that that continues from the first three books. And, you know, it does continue in the next ones as well. So yep. foil for me. And then I like that little just where the they put the title of the book it's different every time they could just plunk it on the front but nope it's a little little creativity thanks mary yep mary grand prize is great and whoever did the like placement of things i'm sure they did something too <laughs> uh, that's our tots oh who me who me couldn't be then you I know. I th- Sorry. I'm just, I'm busting chops today. Those are all the chops that I'm going to bust today because that's the end of our episode. Um, If you want to listen to more Dialogue Alley, there are plenty of places that you could do so. Apple, Google, Spotify, Pandora, Alexa, play Dialogue Alley podcast. Um, You can see pictures and find us on social media and all of those things in a plethora of different ways. You can see Carly's pictures at All the Pretty Books on Instagram, Eric at Nocturne Eric. You can follow me at Harry Potter Collection. Um, We also referenced our websites a few times. So if you want to get a little bit more information on that first edition, first print Sorcerer's Stone that we were talking about, you could do that at Carly's website, alltheprettybooks.net or mine, theharrypottercollection.com. We also have a website for this podcast, which is dialoguealley.com. We're in the works of doing like a pretty decent update to the website because we want to make it a bit more reference based for you guys as well. So the, some of these things that we talk about, you could just visit our website. Um, we are also on Twitter, on Facebook. I'm on TikTok. I'm not even going to say them. They're here. Like, you can find them. They're in the notes. Did you know we have notes? We do. It's crazy. Um, but I will mention one of our favorite places that you can find this podcast is on MuggleNet. We are a MuggleNet family podcast, and there are a whole other bunch of awesome Harry Potter podcasts that MuggleNet do- puts out as well. And we're just one of them, and it's pretty awesome. Um, and if you like what you're listening to, you can always support us a little bit more than just listening to us by subscribing to our Patreon. So we have a bunch of different tiers, and you could access our Discord, which we also reference in this episode, um, bonus episodes, also add free episodes, crazy, just all these things. Um, and you can do that by visiting www.patreon.com slash dialogue alley. Um, but for today, it is all we have time for, so you can walk back through the archway and into your daily lives, and we will catch you next time. Bye. Bye. See ya. Bye.